Welcome to the Future Generations Podcast, providing you with the world-changing content necessary to inspire you, your family, and our planet to a life of optimal health potential. We'll help you make the choices that powerfully influence the lives you bring into this world. It's time to strengthen our resolve to do better now and for our future generations with your host, Dr. Stanton Hom. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Future Generations Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Stanton Hom, and this is this is an episode I've been looking forward to for I would say I don't remember when you popped up on my radar, Dr. Melissa, but I I heard Kelly Brogan speak in like 2014, 2013, 2014, at the Freedom for Family Wellness Summit by the ICPA. And she, in one of her talks, which she was a very different iteration of who she was back then, um, she did a whole conversation on Germany medicine. And it was the first time I had heard those words put together. It never led me down the path to study it. And then if I were to fast forward over the last, you know, three years or so, I have seen a, an emergence of a voice that I feel has spoken to a core of who I am as a practitioner, a core of who I am maybe philosophically as a human being, and then maybe just a core of who I am biologically that um, is you. And so for those of you um, who don't know who Dr. Melissa Sell is, um, I'm very excited to have this interview. But Melissa, I'd first have you introduce yourself. I'd love for you to introduce yourself so our audience gets to know you both personally and professionally. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to meet you. I've said before, I feel like I know you already just through, you know, all of our mutual connections. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I'm Dr. Melissa Sell, and I am a chiropractor, and I graduated chiropractic school in 2012 and practiced full time for several years. Um, and uh, my partner and I, we kind of started getting into looking more at the internal experience. So, you know, in my work previously, it was all you know, eat this, don't eat that, change your products, get adjusted, do your exercise, like really just change your lifestyle. And that I was extremely passionate about that my entire time in school and in my time in practice. And, um, but there was a missing piece for myself in my own life. And it was like the inner work, kind of that deep shadow work, what's going on behind the scenes. So my partner and I kind of started going in that direction even prior to when I stumbled across German New Medicine, which is was in 2017, I was just listening to a podcast. I heard the words, you know, the lady just mentioned it briefly and moved on. She said German New Medicine. And I, you know, I fancied myself at that point as, as like, I thought I knew everything about health. I thought like I had the lockdown and all things holistic health, how to prevent disease, you know, the nervous system. I thought I had, I knew exactly how it all worked. And then I hear about this story of this man, this German medical doctor who developed testicular cancer after his son was shot in this huge shocking um, event that happened. And, you know, his 17 year old son died in his arms and then he went on to develop testicular cancer. And then he went on to study other cancer patients. So he was a traditionally trained medical doctor. He worked in oncology. And so he started testing his hypothesis that there was a connection between the tragedy of losing his son and his testicular cancer. So, you know, he starts to interview testicular cancer patients and tries to see what was going on with you, what happened in your life prior to this diagnosis. And he found patterns start to emerge that every man had some type of loss, whether it was the loss of a child, a loved one, um, a, an intense breakup, a betrayal, they lost someone in their life and the testicles um, developed cancer and women with a glandular breast tumor, they always had a profound worry experience. Everyone with lung cancer had some type of death fright, death of themselves, or they're fearing the death of someone else. Um, everyone with colon cancer had an ugly, indigestible situation they couldn't process for years and years prior to finding out that they had cancer. And so, uh, so what Dr. Hammer found was that this pattern, it didn't seem random. It didn't seem like, you know, that the body's just developing this for no reason, that it's just an error in genetics um, or just some type of toxic exposure that led to this cancer. It seemed to have a rhyme and a reason. And so he then went and looked at the brain. So he's like, okay, these people are having some type of complex, intense emotional experience. 
and their physical tissues are changing in specific ways, there's got to be something going on in the brain as the control system that is relaying the outside to the inside. And so he looked at CT brain scans and he found that there were impacts in specific areas of the brain that always correlated with that organ. And so the, these laws of nature started to emerge for him, and he ended up mapping out every tissue in the body based on embryology, which is one of the things that really drew me to this work because, you know, in chiropractic school, one of our first classes is the, you know, embryology and studying all the germ layers. And so that was a very, I, I loved that class in school. So when I saw that he correlated each different uh, you know, because there's different types of cancers. He looked at the specific tissue type of that cancer and found that it followed a specific pattern and that different germ layers, diff different tissue types follow a different pattern. And he correlated all of this again to the brain, to the experience and has mapped out five biological laws. So needless to say, my mind was completely blown when I came across this information. And then I started observing first my own experience and saw the consistent patterns again and again. You know, one of the first things for me was with acne. I went through the whole journey of all the things I thought caused acne. Is it not washing my face well enough? Bacteria getting down into my pores, you know, and I would wash my face with uh, alcohol and, uh, you know, rubbing alcohol and, and acid and all these things that just burn off all of the bacteria. I'd still have breakouts. Then I thought it was diet. And I was like, I'm going to have the perfect diet and I'd eat clean and my skin would get a little better, but I'd be eating clean and I'd get a breakout. Then I thought it was gut bacteria and eating more sauerkraut and having probiotics. Same pattern. It would get better for a little while. I'd be doing all the right things. And then I'd get a breakout. And it wasn't until reading Dr. Hammer's map, understanding that acne comes from the dermis, from the deeper layer of skin and the sub sebaceous glands in the skin. And when you feel, when you have an experience, a shock of feeling attacked or soiled, so like dirtied or gross in some way, the deeper tissue in the skin, it adapts by thickening. So that skin thickens, and that is the, that's the conflict active phase of that program. And then when you resolve it, when you wash your face, uh, you resolve the conflict or you resolve the feeling attacked, you kind of get over it, you forgive the person or have a conversation that clears it up, then you get a pimple. And when I started seeing the connection between that, that was like my first really solid, ooh, this guy is on to something, you know? And so I, I studied it deeply and began teaching because I feel, I felt very in alignment with everything that Dr. Hammer was saying on a philosophical basis, based on my, you know, experience in chiropractic and the innate intelligence of the body and reading the green books and knowing that there is a deep, wisdom in the body. The body built itself from scratch. It knows exactly what it's doing all of the time. And that disease is never a mistake. It's always an intentional adaptation. And so this map, I, I feel, gives us even more depth to that wisdom and specificity. So rather than, oh, stress causes cancer or stress leads to disease, it's like specific types of conflicts lead to specific tissue adaptations that manifest in specific um, external symptoms. And so that's kind of the overview of, you know, German new medicine, how I got into it. And yeah. It's kind of interesting. Um, as I was sharing with you before uh, we hit record, as my face stopped working and I had right-sided Bell's palsy, it was, it was interesting to read through and what I had read through. And it's similar to what you just said, that, that even an externalization of a symptom, right? A, a acne, right? Versus a pimple, like even having a framework for the the progression of a of a disease, disease pattern right that that largely we don't really have context for like we just think symptom bad symptom bad get rid of it right and obviously not the listeners of this podcast and not obviously you and i but collectively society is is like symptom <laughs> symptom bad and and for me it was like i was reading through some of these notes and was like the 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 presentation of actual facial drooping and bell's palsy is actually a sign that there's already been some sort of process and and transformational healing and the and and the and the the physical manifestation is a sign that it's moving through the body which is very it was so weird to just read through because i was like uh this 
this thing on the side, like my face is not working. How could that be a sign of, of healing, you know? And so it was an interesting, um, but very powerful because it took this amorphous um, blob. And this is me being, say like you, before you walk down this path of German new medicine, I consider myself really smart. And I consider myself very, very well versed in um, obviously chiropractic and exactly like you're saying, lifestyle transformative guidance, you know, and, and shepherding and mentoring and leading and people, but then also just recognize that the nervous system is a master system. But I was humbled and I, and, and I was really like looking for an understanding. And it was the first time that I read something that I was like, ooh, oh, interesting. Oh, there's like real context. And for me at the time, there was, this litany of emotions, emotional stress and problems per se. But when I read through it, I was like, ooh, I'm very refined. This actually speaks to me, like losing face, like spoke to me. And it was like, it was very powerful. I really appreciate your context because it was very selfish of me to want to interview you because I have a feeling it was gonna, gonna really help my journey as well. So that's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, so even just in that example, so the, you know, the muscles, the motor function of the muscles, you know, it's controlled from the motor cortex. And when we have, you know, something that causes us to feel frozen in fear, you know, so the face specifically is like, yeah, a loss of status, loss of reputation or respect, or in some way feeling, yeah, exposed or, you know, ridiculed. So loss of face the biological reaction is like this frozen in fear. And we know this like animals, they play dead. It's like the play dead reflex. Mm -hmm. And so when we have decreased motor function to our muscles, it is the our bio, the ancient biology's way of protecting you. So it says, oh no, we need to paralyze this muscle group so mm -hmm. that there's no movement there so that we can get out of this danger. So that's like when, again, when we're kind of decoding what the symptom means, we have to look at it in the ancient context. Yeah. When was this beneficial? And it's like, of course, it would be extremely beneficial to actually not even have, it's not like the animal is faking playing dead. It, it like it's biology, biological, yeah not having motor signals going to the muscle. So it's kind of functionally dead in that yeah. sense. So when yeah. someone comes with MS or any kind of um, motor paralysis symptoms, whether it's Bell's palsy or, you know, that you're just like, oh yeah, like MS is how people um, often will, will see motor symptoms manifest is that it starts with paralysis during the conflict active phase. And then when you resolve the conflict, you get spasms. And so when a person is twitching or has spasms and it culminates in a seizure, that's the epicrisis. That's like the height of the healing. Wow. You know, people get out when they have a seizure, but when you understand that it's actually the end of the program, you're going through the healing crisis, how you react. And that's one of the huge things that reframes when you understand the laws and you understand like the healing crisis and that it's going to be this big, might be scary event. But when you understand, oh, that means I'm on the other side of it, yeah. instead of going, you know, in and having it all diagnosed. And then they say now, oh, you have a condition you have, you know, you have to take these pills for forever because, you know, they don't know where seizures come from. They don't know why they happen. They just look at a few data points and they say, oh, you have this condition. But when you understand the laws, it's like, no, this makes yeah. perfect sense. So to go back to what you were saying before, the germ layers, you may have lost some people there. That happens like week three, right? Week three or so embryo embryological development. Um, I've said for many years now that uh, there's actually only one way onto the planet. Like there's like human gestation and there's no real escaping uh, this, this journey, right? Through pregnancy and there's no opting out, there's no unsubscribing, and we're all born to some degree through this really miraculous process that is just our biology. But it is the, you're saying that the relationships of that, that developmental stage stay essentially long-term. So the ectoderm, the mesoderm, the endoderm, that kind of structure, because they're very uniquely foundational for where every part of the body develops out of um i've learned something very similar through like functional neurology i believe we call it homologous homologous, homologous columns that neurologically there is an 
infinite relationship to organ function and neurological function, which goes all the way back to those same layers, essentially what you're saying as well. It's not just neurology, exactly. it's biology, which is far, in my opinion, far more enveloping and superior than, than just the neurology, right? It's beautiful. Yeah. And it's all intertwined, you know, so the brain, the psyche, the brain, the organ, you, there's, there's no way to separate these things. So the mind is not separate from the body. The body is, they are, everything about it is all intertwined because that is how organisms survive. And that's where, you know, the, the core of this is, you know, nature does what makes sense. I love, I use the term biological because yeah. it's life logic. So bio is life and and it's what makes sense in order for life to keep going. And so we need these adaptive programs at the ready. You know, that's the thing is every person has the capacity to express every disease that's ever been known to man. We all have that same basic equipment that we're working with, but every person, um, that's another thing I love about this work is so unique in their, how they experience the world, you know? And so even things that we see familial trends of having certain conditions, it's because you were incubated. So I, I love the way that you describe the embryology is like, Everyone goes through this, like you can't get out of this part. You can't opt out of going through, you know, the stage of being a sperm and an egg and a blastocyst and the, you know, the cellular uh, proliferation that occurs in the differentiation into the three germ layers. And Dr. Hammer also correlated each of these germ layers to the, um, the history of development of humankind over time oh. so that the endoderm. So this is the oldest tissue in the brain. And this is like, if you just think about the most basic organism that's, you know, in the ocean, it's like a ring formation. It's got one opening for the mouth and, and for the waste expulsion, it comes in. So the food comes in through the cloaca, through the opening, it makes a right hand turn. It goes around this very primitive digestive system and exits out the left, out that same opening. So that's this basic ring shaped um, primitive organism. And if you look at the brainstem on a brain scan, you can see the formation of each of the organs that you would pass through during that journey. And that's where the control centers are in the brain for the brainstem. Wow. You know, so we have the right in and the left out. So this is super interesting is like, um, so for example, the tonsils, the tonsils are made from endodermal tissue. So those are ancient, you know, it's the, the basic tissue that, um, and the, the theme for the endodermal tissue has to do with obtaining the morsel. So a morsel conflict. So a morsel is anything that you need in order to survive. So it could be a sound morsel because there's endodermal tissue in the inner ear. It could be a food morsel, obviously. So anything we need to better digest, it could be the air morsel. So the lung alveoli are also derived from endodermal tissues. And so all of these have the function of helping us to absorb and to digest. So it's very much based in survival. And so the right tonsil, the conflict for the right tonsil is not being able to insalivate. I need to better insalivate a morsel. And so the right tonsil will grow so it can produce more uh, saliva so I can better insalivate and break down the morsel. And now so that because it's on the right side, now the left tonsil and all of the uh, left-sided endodermal derived tissues have to do with getting rid of the morsel. So I want to spit this out. So again, right in, left out. The thyroid gland, same thing. It's about feeling too slow is the theme for the thyroid. So the right side of the thyroid, the conflict is feeling too slow to catch a morsel. The left side is feeling too slow to get rid of it. And so again, we see this pattern, this theme, the inner ear. If a child has like a middle ear infection where, you know, there's discharge, anytime there's like a funky odor, we know that the endodermal tissues are involved. And so like the ear during the conflict of, I want to hear something, I want to, I want you to hear, I want to hear you say something to me versus the left ear is I wished I didn't hear what I don't want to hear that you know, so right in left out. So that's one of the themes with the endodermal tissue. And again, all control from the brain stem. It's, it's, it is so wild, right? Because we have been through this thing over the last three and a half years. And something that I've been saying for, for a really long time is when they say losing taste and smell, or some people develop some sort of vertigo, or some people develop the Bell's palsy, or some people are developing, you know, certain eye issues. Um, all of that's brainstem, right? And 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 
and most people consider them different conditions, different body parts, which you would give a framework for why somebody would present that way. But neurologically, I would look and be like, wow, like it's actually rooted in a very similar kind of neurological place. But then you would say the presentation would be uniquely bio-individual based upon what that unique maybe even perception of the world through their own value set could could create certain different disturbances inside you know it's kind of it's kind of a wild i hope we're not going too intellectual right now for our listeners however i i i I really 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 appreciate that because i think what people what i hope people are getting uh, are getting from this so far is that it isn't just that your emotions or your view of the world affect your internal physiology or your internal like resiliency or your ability to self-heal and self-regulate and adapt. It's how, right? It's how they do. And, and the lens that you are, are providing is, is, is super powerful because I, I never even thought about that either. Like the, the, the pr- not priority, but the, I don't know what the right word is. You said the oldness, right? The the ancient nature of the endoderm versus the other layers is is even contextual for how the human has kind of navigated through its own development over time, right? It's it's such a wild understanding because it's it's like a framework for life, right? Which is wild. Exactly. It's absolutely wild. Totally. And I, I would be interested to see kind of like <laughs> modern neurology. And that's the thing, is every field of science, you know, needs to kind of reorient their understandings around, again, the tissue layer, because I don't see Mm -hmm. any other, no Mm -hmm. other, you know, we definitely didn't learn about it in chiropractic school about Mm -hmm. how each of the germ layers have a specialization. And so that's a way a person can think about it is like everyone knows about fight or flight, but you can think about this as like specialized, specific fight or flight adaptations in response to specific things that happen, you know, and this is highly, so yes, we can get like super nerdy and into all of like the details of the science of how this functions, but on just the most practical level, it is paying attention to the symptoms that show up and the themes in your experience and, and decoding it. So for example, you know, one of the conditions that I've seen great success with tons of people that I've worked with have been able to clear up psoriasis, eczema, you know, rashy, itchy skin conditions. And so rashy, itchy skin conditions have to do with separation conflicts. And so a separation conflict, it's like, so we've got this, you know, this is the ectodermal layer. So it's controlled from the cerebral cortex. And so this has to do with physical touch and being like closeness. I want to be close, you know, and this starts obviously right out of the womb, you know, immediately the, you know, how you spend those early hours and days of your life really set up. Do I feel, you know, secure? Do I feel like I've got the connection and touch because touch for an infant is survival. If I'm not being touched and held, um, that means that I am in imminent threat, imminent danger. You know, if I can't smell my mother, if I don't have skin to skin contact with her, you know, I'm I'm basically dead, you know, and that that's what the primal ancient part of you is experiencing. Um, and so that's why, you know, closeness is everything. And now when we don't have that closeness, if, if we, you know, have it for a little bit and then it's taken away from us, you know, the, the skin literally will thin in that area. And the functionality of that is to numb. Also, when we have separation conflicts, we have memory loss. You know, and this is like the classic you hear. I remember being told when I was a kid, oh, you know, if a cat loses its kittens, she forgets about them. You know, she forgets they even exist. And it's like, it's be, that's because nature is merciful. And if a mother, you know, loses the child and we're separated from who we want to be close with, you know, the brain just says, okay, we, we can forget that. So kids, little kids with, you know, what they call ADD or ADHD, it's like they're dealing with often separation conflicts, also motor conflicts. So being stuck in a chair and being separated from mom. So I've got memory loss. I can't remember to bring my backpack. I can't can't remember, you know, all these things. And it's, and it's indicative of separation conflicts and not having the closeness. And then you add, you know, rashes on the skin, look at the handedness. If you are right dominant, your right side is your partner side. 
And if, and your left side is your mother child side, and then it's opposite for left hander. So basically your non-dominant side is like your caregiving side. And so either, you know, your mother or your child is going to be, um, the symptoms associated with that person is going to show up on your non-dominant side and anyone else basically is going to show up on your dominant side. So with, with that, what I appreciate more than anything is just, is the context, right? The context of, and the depth and the meaning of, of our unique presentation, however we do present from, whether it's a physiological level or a symptomatic level. This is a more broad question, but what would you say is one of the biggest like challenges we face today? as a, as a, I would just say maybe even as a species, cause, cause you're so, you're so biological wide, you know, I'm curious if you give, give me a framework for that. Well, it's the non-biological living, like everything about how we live is not oriented to our biology, you know, and one of the big themes that's been coming up lately is just talking about, you know, women in, in society and feminism and just the idea that um, that the woman is equal to the man or the same as the man. And the thing is, is that's not true biologically. Wow. Biologically, women have different, like we can, our equipment is different. Like the man has bigger hands and bigger bones and bigger muscles and is equipped for protecting the territory. The, the female has smaller hands and has, you know, better ability to detect different sounds and, and different colors so that she can care for the young. So her whole biology is specialized for raising children, whereas the man, he's specialized for protecting and defending the territory. And so that isn't just a social construct. That isn't just gender roles and things that we just fobbed off as, oh, you know, that's not true. That's just society. Absolutely not. That has come out of biology, you know, and even, you know, when you look at the biological themes that come up, this is, it's all, it was oriented in the biology first, and then the language came out to describe the biology. So even think about when people say, I want to bite his head off, or I was sick to my stomach, or I was crawling out of my skin, or I need to grow thicker skin. Where do we have all of these, you know, all of this language that so perfectly describes what's actually happening on the tissue level? But the language came after the biology. The biology was here first, and then we have you know, grown out of this biological system. And so in order to become healthier, we need to return to biological order because if we don't, again, we are in a society that is illogical, that everything we do is inverted and reversed. And, you know, women not having babies in a physiological way, you know, cutting the baby out of the body, feeding it with a bottle, not having that closeness and connection. So mom can go back to work, you know, and it's just, it, we have to look at how that's affecting us as a species, you know? And so we have a lot of kids today that were raised in that manner and they, you know, they don't have a connection to their body. They don't have a connection to their parents. They don't have a connection to their, their lineage and what allowed them to survive to this point. And we see epidemic levels of infertility and non-interest, non-interest in continuing the species, which our ancient ancestors would be like, what are you crazy? Like, how do you, what do you think is going to happen next? <laughs> if you don't keep this game going, then the game is over and biology and nature, nature just wants to keep playing this game. It just wants to keep, you know, uh, configuring, let's bring two together, let's shake up and see what happens. Nature really wants to do that. But when we live anti-biological lives, um, people become uninterested in doing that. And, you know, if we extrapolate that out over time, that doesn't end well for our species. And so returning and, and looking at where am I living out of harmony with my biology. And I do think that there is a way that we can kind of utilize the benefits of technology without, you know, merging with technology and actually, cause that's the, you know, you know, that's the kind of big nefarious goal is to merge the people and the, you know, really actually upload everyone into the matrix. Um, and so returning to biology, learning this biological map that has been suppressed intentionally suppressed hasn't been you know dr hammer he had legit like studies and showed he, he would do these university board panels where basically all these university doctors would be there and he'd have a case and he'd look at the brain scan and the person's history 
and he'd be able to pick out exactly what was going on with them, you know, and he was accurate every single time. And basically to the point where, you know, he had university verifications, but it was never taken to that, you know, that bigger level where they actually accepted it, accepted what he had to say, because you can see how it jeopardizes. If people knew this, it jeopardizes everything about the system as it is. What year was Dr. Hammer doing all of this? So 1981 is when he first submitted his wow. thesis to the University of Tübingen. Yeah, so it's been, you know, that's why the name, so German New Medicine, mm -hmm. um, several years ago with one of the recent bo books that he had written before he passed, he's like, it's not new anymore. It's, yeah. I've been, you know, talking about this for 30 years. And so he's changed the name to Germanic healing knowledge or Germanische gotcha. Heilkunde also mm -hmm. to get away from the medicine connotation. Yeah. So you'll hear it described as GNM, German new medicine or Germanic healing knowledge. It's, it's, I, I, I guess I didn't realize it was so, so current, you know, compared to you know, when we understand like when Rockefeller Medicine took over, the Flexner reports in the early 1900s, and you know, you understand like, but as 1981, I think was the same year of Wilk versus AMA. I think that was the same year that chiropractors took the AMA to court, won, you know, and found them guilty of an illegal boycott on chiropractic. And they discovered the commission on quackery and the foundations for all the psychological operations that, you know, make chiropractic the black sheep of the black sheep of the black sheep. And so it's interesting, right? Because you can watch even news spots back then and you can see it's almost like the media was doing what the media was supposed to do back then. So maybe he did have an opportunity and a window of time where he could have had some more acceptance into the mainstream to some degree, but it's it's wild to, to think about, you know, because I did some studying with a uh, Canadian chiropractor by the name of James Chestnut. I don't know if you've heard of him, but oh he, yeah, I love James Chestnut. So James, like his his he promulgated a philosophy that I really thought was so important, and he said there's really only two causes of disease, and and one is um, toxicity, and the other is deficiency. And basically, he said, anytime that you are living in mismatch from what your biological expectation of the environment is, then you're living in a state of toxicity or deficiency, right? And he said, the only way to healing is purity and sufficiency. What I love about what you're sharing is it actually, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when I'm going to be studying down this path. I appreciate the inspiration, is it's giving me a framework for how to decipher that toxicity and deficiency. It's how to decipher embryologically, maybe foundationally, biologically, maybe where that disturbance is. And then maybe where also externally, environmentally, it probably refines a lot of your, your recommendations really, really, really well based upon uniquely versus what used to be is just like, hey, just eat more fruits and vegetables, right? Hey, just eat more food, you know? And it became, it's a very broad, which can help so many people mm -hmm. to just live well, right? But on the opposite end is getting really refined as far as somebody's biologically unique needs based upon their own unique symptom presentation, which is not a bad thing. It's actually just a part of the infinite wisdom that we're all made from, which is super wild. I love that. Totally. One of my favorite uh, James Chestnut quotes is, you know, there is no pathology. There's yeah. only adaptive physiology. And yeah. that is like, that is GNM because yeah. all of GNM, it's like the specificity of the adaptive physiology that this is that. not a mistake. Your body is not doing the wrong thing. It's doing exactly the appropriate thing that's necessary in order for you to biologically survive. Mm -hmm. However, there's also, you know, tissue limitations where it's like when you're in conflict, animals in nature aren't in conflict for years and years and years at a time. It's like a few minutes, maybe 30 seconds. And then I, you know, I either run away and I survive or I die and that's it. And so, but humans, we have this grand capacity to uh, perseverate on our conflicts and to go back into conflicting situations and keep ripping the scab off and keeping the wound open. And that's where, you know, the tissue is adapting and it is doing the right thing. And that's one of the things that's hard for people to understand, like, oh, how could cancer be the body doing the right thing? And it's that you just keep pressing this button, you keep activating this adaptation mm -hmm. that over time, you know, it will get to the point where, you know, the tissues are having trouble even to 
continue their normal physiology simply because you've been in adaptive physiology and there's a time limit for adaptive physiology before it becomes, listen, we have, you know, like when you have a fire in a building and the sprinklers go off, that's a, that's an adaptation. That's a wonderful adaptation. But if you turn the sprinklers on in your building every day, it's like, listen, we, the, the computers, the, the, like things are rotting away because of this consistent water. And so it's like, like we have to understand that the goal is to recognize and resolve soon. We want to be eight. And that's why, again, this map is so vital. It's unfortunate. And it breaks my heart when people, you know, don't come across this until they've already had a diagnosis for years. And they're, you know, struggling against the fear, the label, you know, what their family thinks they should do, what the doctor thinks they should do. And so they're like, and then they find this, this map for understanding why they're in this position. But again, once you're in that position, it's, you know, you've got a lot of different ideas in your mind, a lot of different fears. And yes, knowing that your body has been doing the right thing this whole time is so, so brings so much peace. Um, but we also just have to acknowledge that it's like the tissues aren't, they, they didn't, they haven't yet adapted to these long-term adaptations. And I think that that will come in time. It's like, listen, these humans, they just stay in conflict for forever. And I think that we will, you know, evolve and some new adaptations will come to maybe short circuit certain adaptations, but we haven't gotten there yet. You know, we've changed our lifestyles dramatically in the last couple hundred years. And so our daily lives are so incredibly different than those of our ancestors that there, you know, there is this mismatch between the signals that we're sending in and just this ancient body's ability to, to kind of keep up with all of it. It's a unique, that, that that's a really powerful statement, right? Because you, you made a statement earlier that one of the biggest challenges is that with this non-bio, non-biological lifestyle that we have, that we have been just forced into generationally now, and I would I would say that we are seeing maybe what that adaptation is or that 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 maladaptation is per se is in our kids like our kids like we we specialize in children we specialize in pregnancy and we see very clear as day uh, kids that come through our practice when moms are under prenatal chiropractic care and they understand what conscious birth is and we see kids that are referred to our practice and this isn't to shame or or, or marginalize anybody who is on either side. But there is a there is a tangible difference, which is why I activated over the last three and a half years is because we have a framework, which I still am humbled to the fact that I don't believe we know what normal is, although we can see a black and white difference of what people who have been brought into the world in a more biologically aligned perspective versus a non biologically very traumatic entry into the world. Um, it's, it couldn't be more black and white and the increased nature of chronic quote illness is, is, is not just, it was already a, a, a catastrophe long before there was a 2020 for our kids. What would you say, how would you verbalize your mission today? I love people who are living from this deep sense of purpose. I love the fact that we have a similar mentor in James Tesla, but how would you verbalize your, your mission today? helping people to connect with this biological wisdom, because I think, you know, and I love, you know, the mission of future generations. And that really is, that's where it's at. It's in the the young, you know, the families, the mothers, the children being raised with this from the beginning, little kids. And I just love the, the women in my community who just, you know, are teaching their kids where their kids know, oh, mommy, I, you know, I have a tummy ache because I got angry. I had an indigestible, you know, conflict on the playground and they get it. And they know that when they sneeze, it was because of a stink conflict. And they know that when, you know, they have an itchy mm. rash, it's because they have a separation and the kids get wow. it. And it's very intuitive. And so that is my mission is to share this wisdom with as many people who, uh, that are ready to hear, you know, this is how my body functions because it, you know, it really, the mission is spreading peace. You know, and I find that that peace and that freedom comes through understanding, because if, if we are living in these bodies our whole lives and we're living in fear and fear of disease and fear of sickness and fear of germs and things that can come it, like when you're living in that fearful state, that um, that that's the, the generation of all these adaptations It's the fear. It's the shock. It's the oh, am I going to survive? And so when you understand that there is nothing to fear, that there is no germ, there's no gene, there's no part of your body that ever will turn on you, that it's all, are you cultivating peace and harmony? 
Are you living in alignment with your, like how you actually want to be living? Are you living in alignment with the biological laws and helping people to know what that is, be able to recognize it? You know, in my work, I really focus on awareness because I do find that people, because again, our modern lives are just so distracted and we're constantly, you know, bright, shiny object syndrome because we've got places to go and people just, and we're always externally oriented and you know, in order to track these conflicts, in order to really understand what's going on with me right now, I have to develop inner vision. I have to be able to see what's happening with me. I have to have self-awareness. And so that really is the, the core message of all of my work is becoming more aware. I have to become aware. I have to see what's happening inside of me because if I, you know, don't slow down long enough to connect the dots between what happened yesterday and the symptom I have to have today. You know, what was I feeling yesterday? What was I going through? What was my experience? You know, if you're too busy and too rushed and you can't even like remember what happened yesterday and make those connections, it's going to be difficult for you to enact and kind of use this map in your life. And so slowing down, paying attention, developing self-awareness, you know, and, and then, you know, showing that modeling that to your children, you know, your peace becomes their peace, your agitation becomes their agitation. And so, you know, as you are raising children, it is, are you cultivating, you know, because your child is hearing every conflict that's going on with you. They know it, they feel it, you know, and even to the point where they, you know, children and mother can be so in sync that the child develops like the same exact symptoms the mother does, or the mother may not be ex exhibiting symptoms, but the child is because the child knows that you want to bite your in-laws head off and they, their teeth adapt for you <laughs> because you are feeling it so deeply, you know, so you have to recognize what's going on with you and, and work to again, find solutions. If you just live in that solution oriented state and you're aware and you're connecting these dots that really is you know the lifestyle that i cultivate for myself and that you know i hope to share with you know people everywhere is how to cultivate that for themselves do you see that because you said the dominant side of the body is your partner side of the body and then the 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 non-dominant side is the caregiver mother child side is mm -hmm. is that so that's that is hardwired, that is biological. And so is it ever, I, I, that is so wild that you said that because I, I, I feel like we are going, we, we are literally going through that right now. My wife and our oldest, they are going, like my wife is, is literally dissolving these generational trauma patterns and addressing a lot of these shadows. And I'm watching my daughter just like, 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 Ex, like completely like bloom in ways that mm. we and then the relationship really bonding in a way that had never like in four years has never actually happened it is a wild thing to watch because in my mind I'm like well yeah you grew her you know like there's no real like of course you're connected but but you're saying that it's even contextual to the point where a mother's physiological presentation adaptive physiology unique to whatever that kind of underlying germ layer could actually present in in kid too mm -hmm. crazy. yeah because again it's a, the child is picking up but i went to um a women's festival over the summer and so many women were just like oh my child they eat perfect but their teeth their teeth are rotting out like what's going on i never feed them sugar i brush the teeth what is the deal and it's a bite conflict and I'm like, okay, so is there anyone that the child wants to bite and isn't allowed to bite? And wow. then they're like, oh, I don't know. And I was like, is there anyone you want to bite that you're not allowed to bite? And they're like, <gasps> and it's like, okay, that, you know, wow. your child is again, when they are so, they're just like one, you're one unit for a really long time, mm -hmm. the mother and the child. And so the baby is feeling everything that you're feeling every time you want to snap at your in-laws and you have to hold back that causes adaptation in the teeth. And so that's what leads to, you know, if it's the enamel or the dentin, there's erosion, there's breakdown. And, and so that is what you need to pay attention to. So one of the, the, the tips for, for mothers and, and babies, especially like little babies and uh, little children um, is to speak to them in their sleep you know, tell them, like, speak to their psyche, see, speak to their subconscious mind, 
this is who mommy wants to bite. This is what I'm dealing with right now. You know, thank you, but you don't have to carry this conflict for me. Wow. And some like I have heard wonderful reports of like when you kind of speak that and, and you know, because a lot one of the main things like with a conflict is that you feel isolated in it. You're, you're not talking about it. You feel all alone. You feel, you know, overwhelmed, overloaded. I don't know what to do. And so often, even just by talking about it, you can downgrade it. So talking about it, bringing it out of the darkness and into the light, kind of just sharing with the child your real human experience and, you know, letting them know they don't have to carry it. Sometimes literally that can cause everything to turn for them just because you, you know, unburdened and you help them to release this thing that they were holding on to again, because they're, you know, their biology is just trying to help you. Your biology is trying to help them. So we are working in these units together as a family. And uh, so that's really cool that you guys are seeing that in your, in your family. And it's, it's, it gives also again, context to, oh, your life is a mirror. It's like, or your children are mirrors of you. They're the opposite of you. It's like, actually they're, they're, they're biologically expressing the thing that perhaps you need to be reconciling to some degree. It's, it's, it's really powerful. What would you say, future pace that world for me, that you are committed to co-creating, that you are on a mission to creating, what, is that, what does that world look like to you? Oh, it's just, it's fearless health. It's people who understand laws of nature that are working towards moving into more harmony, with the laws of nature, with the way that they raise their children, with the way that they spend their time, with the way that they make their money, um, with the way that they kind of, you know, facilitate conflict resolution among smaller groups of people. And that's the thing too, is like finding out who is my conflict really with? Like what, who am I, who am I dealing with on a regular basis? Are our vision so out of alignment? Can I ever create harmony in this relationship or do I need to create something new? So, you know, this, this vision is people just just kind of getting it. They understand what makes them tick. You know, and that's the thing too, is I believe more than anything in the adaptability of humans, you know, so yes, are there, is there an ideal for everyone to be living in kind of smaller village type settings where people, you know, mothers actually have other mothers to mother with and to, you know, to help and kind of create these, these smaller, more harmonious communities. Um, that would be ideal. You know, however, we can't just wave a wand and make that happen. A lot of kind of infrastructure stuff and relocations and, you know, and that might be the vision, but we don't have to wait till we get there in order to start enacting the wisdom of this truth. We start right now. We start right now by learning how to, you know, be okay with things as they are, even if things aren't ideal, you know, because if I have to, and that's part of it too. So, you know, uh, like the strict kind of core uh, German new medicine is very like biologically based and very like, let's get a practical resolution. Let's change your practical environment because that's always going to be the fastest, especially for kids and for animals, because um, the biological laws apply to animals and plants too. Um, let's change the environment. If the child is having chronic, you know, skin rashes and they're going to daycare, that child needs to stay home from daycare and have constant, you know, skin contact. So you might need to change your life because telling the child, oh, mommy will be back in just six hours. And it's not going to, you know, the child's not going to change their mindset, you know, but adults, we can change our mindset. We can change our perspective. We can look at things in a different way. And so we can utilize both the practical changes and the perspective mindset attitude change changes that can resolve conflicts as well. Um, and so I, you know, one, we want to try to facilitate the physical um, external world in a way that's more harmonious, less likely to, you know, be conflictive. And then also we want to be adaptable. And that means I need to be aware and I need to be equipped with the ability to respond in ways that, you know, de-escalate that downgrade conflict that recognize, okay, I was shocked by that. That caught me off guard. Let me, you know, find a solution. Let me kind of, you know, people do all sorts of cool things, you know, with, um, you know, tapping and just working with the nervous system and somatic work so that I can, you know, chill out in this moment, find a solution. And so I, I see, I, I really do see people already adopting many of the tools and the principles that are needed in order to move forward in this harmonious way, but having that basic, those underlying um, truths be built on the biological wisdom of the five biological laws, I think is super duper important, which is why I love coming on, you know, shows like this and helping other, you know, 
chiropractors and doctors and teachers kind of work that because you know this is just the basis we're all working with these laws all the time anyways but to know you know more of the specifics of you know um like connective tissue so all the bones and muscles and joints the theme is self-devaluation you know so helping a person in addition to you know their physical health and exercises and you know uh, spinal work and alignment it's like okay, where are you devaluing yourself? You know, how's your self-esteem doing? Where do you feel, you know, not enough? Because that's showing up on every part of your body. If you're not feeling enough as, as a partner, it shows, it shows up in your shoulders as an athlete, in your legs. You know, it's like, we have to see what's the symbolic meaning in the neck. It's an intellectual self-devaluation. And I was like, ah, oh, so many things make so much sense when you understand like the tissue and what that's uh, experienced what the the message that it's decoding is. What would you say is one very practical thing people can do now? Like, what would you have people take action on in this moment? I would watch the DNM 101. So if you're like cool. brand new to this, if you're like, okay, what is this whole world? It is, you know, there's a lot of parts to it. So it, it's it's kind of hard to just encapsulate in just one, you know, yes, the the your body is adapting to help you. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the big overarching picture. But to get into the specifics, so you're like, okay, my body is adapting to help me, but what about this symptom? So first, you know, kind of learn the overall map. My YouTube channel has a lot of great videos that are, you know, just to get you started in this knowledge knowledge. And I do, um, there's a, a deeper tutorial seminar package that I do recommend people, you know, if you're serious about learning this, and again, I really encourage mothers, especially, mm -hmm. you know, because the mothers, they really are, you know, the cornerstone of the family that you're the person people come to if they've got, you know, an ache and ill, if something's going on. And so to have, you know, if you are lit up about being, you know, this wise woman who is in alignment with nature, who kind of knows this knowledge, I just encourage you to kind of further your studies and just learn a little bit every don't get overwhelmed, you know, because yes, there is a lot. But if you just learn a little bit every day, you look up, you connect these dots before too long, you will be seeing that you you get it. You know what I mean? Like when it lands, when it's out and your intuition has probably already led you to this point. And so just keep following it and learning a little more each day. We'll make sure and have those links in the show notes so that people can access those because um, I was I was interviewed the other day by um, one of my good friends, Matt Bojo, and he has a group of of young men that he mentors. It is it's it's this <laughs> it's a very humbling group because I, I I don't I've, I've spoken on four continents. I have spoken to ten thousand people, and I was like nervous speaking to fifteen year old fifteen year old boys, and all these conversations about healthcare, right? And I was just I would I. I said the reason why one of the main reasons why I'm a chiropractor is when the grid goes down, um, I got my hands, you know, I, I, I don't need power. I don't need anything. I don't, I just need my hands and I need, I need somebody's, you know, physical frame. And, and now, you know, like last week I had a conversation with a mom in, in the practice that was, that was kind of similar, challenging me in a different way saying, well, so what do we do? You know, like, is it, is it the environment or is it, is it chiropractic? And I said, it's, it's both. It's always both. Right. And, and, and you can't be well without being well adjusted, but just because you're well adjusted doesn't mean you're well. And so thank you, Dr. Melissa, because in the end, this is yet another powerful framework because this isn't reserved for practitioners. This is, this is for the general population that you can actually learn which I don't believe is a outward discovery. I think it's an inward uncovering of who we are that it's more like a remembering more so than it's like learning something new because mm -hmm. the more and moms, you will get this, right? You will get this intuitively because you have grown humans. And that is a thing that I am humble to. Thank you for your, thank you, Dr. Melissa, for your directness on many of your posts especially when it relates to gender and biology, because, because I think people just need to remove that framework of whatever is modern and whatever is language-based or whatever it is that we have created that is non-biological and go back to what our biology is, because when mothers do that, especially the power that's behind that 
context that gives context to your intuition um i believe i think you just gave a key to a radical transformation for the world future generations like you said we have a shared mission absolutely i do not see a future that is non-biological and that, and as a as as a chiropractor but also as the leader of this organization and key part of this movement um <laughs> there is no future if we keep going down the path of non-biology i love that i appreciate mm -hmm. you for that yeah, totally. It's good stuff. And I, you know, I just love sharing with people, you know, on this mutual path of just like freedom and health mm -hmm. and uh, just connecting with that innate wisdom because it's all there and you've got all the answers and you, you know, like people are just there to be a mirror to show you what you already know, <laughs> what the truth that's already, you know, cooked into every part of you. Totally. And it's just, just aligning with it and recognizing it because that's the thing is like any mother who's grown a baby knows that the body is amazing and knows exactly what it's doing you know and so just to recognize that on the deepest level and to see that absolutely every little thing the body is doing is is an answer it is a response to something that went on at the psycho spiritual level and by you know seeing and connecting these dots it's like it really does it'll land for you it makes so much sense and it'll bring so much peace to your spirit Dr. Melissa, you mentioned your YouTube channel. How else do people connect with you and how do they find you? Yeah, my YouTube channel, uh, my website, drmelissacell.com, uh, my Instagram, uh, that's, you know, just reading through a lot of just these ideas of how do I integrate this? How do I understand this? How does this, you know, like you said, like the context is so important. And so, yeah, there's a lot of different ways that you can um, check out uh, my work. Um, I've got a blog post where if you're like, oh, where do I study more about uh, GNM, GHK? And there's on that blog post, you'll see all the different resources that, um, that I suggest. And you're also welcome to send a message too. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. This has been, uh, I had, I had expectations. I try not to have those, but I had expectations and it far met and surpassed every expectation I had. And I am so excited to, to just be, um, in community with you and also to just be on the same mission as you. I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. We appreciate you joining us for this episode of the future generations podcast. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes and Spotify. For more resources based on today's episode, as well as more ways to inspire a brighter future for you and your family, visit us at thefuturegen.com. That's all available exclusively on thefuturegen.com.